Welcome to Live Well, Be Well with your host, Sarah Ann Macklin. If I can just ask one thing to my new or old listeners, please hit the subscribe button and also share this podcast with friends. It means more than you realise. If you're feeling like something wrong is going on and everybody else around you is acting like it's all okay, then a child will tell themselves that their response is the problem rather than the event. We remind ourselves of our resilience. We remind ourselves of our ability to survive these difficult things and challenge ourselves to put one foot in front of the other regardless. So being brave isn't about not being scared. It's about doing it anyway. In this week's episode of Live Well, Be Well, I speak to psychotherapist, Emmy Brunner. Author of The Trauma Redefined and Find Your True Voice, I was thrilled to drive down to Emmy's home in Brighton to speak around the topic surrounding trauma, shame, and finding your higher self. Emmy believes that we've all experienced trauma in our lives, and what we refer to now as mental illness is actually our response to those traumas. By cultivating a compassionate relationship with ourselves, we are able to step into our power and create a mindset that expects and generates success. So today we really focus in on these tactics to help elevate you to your highest self. Emmy, welcome to Live Well, Be Well. How are you? Good. Really good, thanks. Thank you for having me in your beautiful home. Thank you for being here. It thanks is... for coming all the way to sunny Brighton. I mean, I feel privileged to get out of London, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, it's a nice day as well. And be by the sea. From today, I'm starting off, actually, by asking all my guests a question. Mm-hmm. And my question to you to start is, what have you changed your mind about in the last decade? Oh, my goodness. So much about working clinically with people has changed so much for me in the last decade everything that I learned in my clinical training in my 20s has been kind of completely rewritten in the last decade everything I've come to learn about people and trauma um, and how to help people heal has shifted so much none of it was taught in a classroom it was all taught mainly from the people that I've worked with honestly have guided me so much and challenged me to think differently about how I work is there anything specifically that you can remember thinking quite differently about in, in that clinical way in, in the trauma setting? Really that people heal people, you know, that actually it's the relationship that heals rather than some sort of clever clinical insight you might have or understanding how trauma might have impacted somebody. It's really about the relationship that you build with somebody mm. and if you can hold space for them and mm. genuinely care and invest in them that 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 in itself is just so incredibly healing mm. if you do nothing else. So it's a lot about connection. So I guess that really did increase in COVID because there was that real loss of connection and, and community. Maybe, mm-hmm. did you see that from a psychotherapist's point of view? Yeah, I think it highlighted truths that were known to me and my team already that how important that connection is. But physical touch and physical intimacy is our kind of natural antidote to depression like it literally is our antidote to depression like it keeps us well and when we don't touch and we isolate we become unwell mentally unwell and so we saw an increase in that over the pandemic which isn't widely surprising to us it was surprising to me that everybody else was so shocked that actually if we don't connect with each other we get sad and actually that's what the human experience is all about it's about love and connection so You've quoted quite a lot actually about trauma and that you believe we all experience trauma to some extent and that reflects in our mental health conditions. So before we actually look at trauma and what trauma is, because I think people might be surprised to hear that, can you tell me a little bit about your own challenges kind of coming to this yourself? I think just um, partly learning through working with other people, just realising how early life experience impacts you and your ability to cope with trauma and life's challenges and experiences Mm. you know we're all resourced from 
the people that raise us in figuring out how to cope and navigate the world. And if there's gaps in that development, then we struggle. As a result, develop different and potentially dysfunctional ways of coping. And that was my experience, just becoming mentally really unwell, developing eating disorders and self-harm and just then having consistently negative relationships that really just reiterated a very negative narrative that I was telling myself. But I didn't really know that that was happening. It was a very unconscious process. I knew perhaps that some of the ways I treated myself weren't very good, but I didn't really understand why. And I didn't have much context around my experience. And I think that's key for anybody is to understand what motivates our behaviours and choices, because then we come empowered to do something differently and to change things. And when it comes to mental health, I think so many of us feel that it's something that is happening to us that we can't control. And so much of healing is about taking responsibility for what we can change and Mm. changing it. It's a really big thing, isn't it, that disassociation from how we feel? Because I think also it ignites a lot of fear. And so in one way we become very dissociated, but in another, such as like an eating disorder, that's also a control mechanism. Mm -hmm. So you feel that you're taking control in that moment. And it could be the same for an addiction or for any type of mental health condition. I always love a podcast recommendation. So today I wanted to share one of my podcasts I am listening to at the moment. And I've also been very lucky to appear as a guest on their show. This is the Roman Cycling Podcast, hosted by the inspiring pro cycler himself, Anthony Walsh, who teaches you how cycling can be used as a tool for health, happiness, and longevity. Anthony shares his own inspirational journey, as well as guests he brings on six times a week. A dedicated man in every area of life. Even if you're not a keen cyclist, you are going to love this show. Anthony talks about sports, nutrition, and mindset, often with big name guests. Make sure you head over to www.roadmancycling.com to check out everything that Anthony has to offer, including his coaching courses and his fantastic podcast. Was there a moment for you, well there must have been because now you're obviously, you've come on so much since then and now you're running a really fantastic recovered clinic in London that works on all of these, What was the moment for you when you actually looked into yourself and thought, well, what's the deep root cause of all of this damaging behaviour, should I say, that I've put myself through more self-sabotage? I think there's been a couple of those kind of moments of insight and introspection where I've had a bit of an aha moment and realised that I need to change things. But I think really was getting to a point where I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s and thinking that I'd been unhappy my entire life and just realising that there would be moments of laughter and moments of reprieve from that, but generally that I'd been unhappy and that being the most depressing thought ever. (laughs) But then also thinking, well, now I'm in a position to change it and now I'm in a position that I'm going to do something differently, not being quite sure what that was, but realising that if I carried on doing the same things, that was going to have the same outcomes. And that I had to be brave to do something different. Mm. Um, And that was kind of the biggest turning point. And then everything from there changed Mm. kind of in the biggest ways Mm. for me, professionally, personally, everything. Mm. And it talks a lot there that you start going back to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in a child work and looking back at, at trauma and things that might have happened. And I'm referencing trauma without actually giving any definition of what trauma is. This could be things like huge life events, but actually you speak about it in a much more open, broader narrative. And would you be able to give a description of really what trauma is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so trauma isn't something uh, that we may experience. It's an inevitability of what it is to be human. And trauma is any challenging or difficult life experience that we witness or go through ourselves. And for some of us, that could be a really catastrophic life event. But often it's not. And often it's something that we perhaps haven't considered to be a trauma. It could be a loss. It could be... Moving schools as a kid can be traumatic. It could be moving house. It could be divorce of a parent. And it really, really depends on um, what your journey is, your life journey. But 
it is inevitable. The key thing is how do we then cope with those traumas when they happen? You know, what are the strategies that we have in place to be able to manage those challenging life experiences? Because if we don't have the strategies, we're going to make them up. We're going to find ways to cope. And particularly children are extremely resilient and resourceful and if they haven't been taught or learnt those tools they will find a way to manage and to survive those life experiences and unless we really have that insight we carry those experiences and those resources with us into adulthood and some of them can be more problematic than others Mm. some of us might know that when things get hard we'll have a glass of wine at the end of the day and that's not a big deal but some of us might go well when life's hard actually I go and have three bottles of wine at the end of the day and that's problematic Mm -hmm. so it just depends there's a scale for so many of these things and I really resonate there with a term where trauma comes back as a reaction not a memory Mm -hmm. and so I think that's where the coping mechanisms seem to come in but we normalize these coping mechanisms and from what I've felt from I guess my own journey and, and people that I've interviewed over the last few years and also seen in clinic myself is that coping mechanisms are quite normal and in the British society that we live in it's that tough upper lip Mm -hmm. that we're all brought up with how do we try to go against that as oneself because I think when you try to lean into that vulnerability you can actually come against a lot of adversity and actually you know that you're more weak how can we lean into that and not be afraid of it I think first of all you need to have a narrative to even have this kind of conversation Mm. I think a lot of the people that I work with when they start trying to explain what's going on with them they don't have a narrative to talk about it they don't have the language to try and express or communicate what it is that they're going through for them to be able to identify what their coping strategies are would be just like 10 steps too far I think Mm. initially it's about having a conversation and being honest with yourself about really how you feel and I think what you identified earlier about that dissociation we dissociate as a way of trying to numb and cope Mm. that in itself is a coping strategy so I think first of all trying to help people have a narrative to talk about these things and not waiting till they're in crisis so I'm a really big believer in helping kids to talk about how they feel because not as a response to a crisis, but because we need to develop a better language. Mm. We need to learn that actually vulnerability is the patron. I always say there's such a naff Harry Potter reference, but it's like our patronus to shame. So it's the way we protect ourselves from shame and isolation is by being vulnerable. Mm. And actually so many of us associate being vulnerable with shame. And actually mm. the opposite is true for us. Mm. You know, we all feel rewarded when a friend confides in us. We feel like we've been chosen to be there for somebody in those moments and we value those moments when other people share themselves with us and yet somehow the story is rewritten when it's us having to show up in a way that's vulnerable with somebody else that we care about. And I really want to digress into shame actually soon because it's something that I think we all suffer from but I think we all find that very hard to identify that's how we feel. Mm -hmm. But before we do, for anyone listening who probably has maybe never thought of themselves as experiencing trauma but now listening to you maybe resonating that we've all experienced trauma to some extent how can we actually reflect on ourselves if we've experienced trauma how can we come to that decision and go well now listening to emmy speak i actually can start to see there could have been traumatic events in my life i think so many of us already know like as we're talking you know there will be people listening who immediately memories will come to mind or things that they've repressed or not thought about for a long time will suddenly occur to them and the thing is when you go through difficult life experiences if they're not validated for you at the time as a trauma by the people around you then young people will just internalize those responses Mm -hmm. if you're feeling like something wrong is going on and everybody else around you is acting like it's all okay then a child will tell themselves that their response is the problem rather than the event and so it's really, really important that you get that validation somehow, that you that you understand that although your experiences may not have been validated at the time, that they're still worthy of being acknowledged as a difficult life experience for you. And yes, there will always be somebody who's been through something more traumatic, but it doesn't mean that those things don't hurt. Just because someone else breaks their leg, it doesn't mean if you cut your finger it doesn't hurt, it still hurts. You can just identify it's not as serious. And how can we, in those moments, also acknowledge if we're having a fearful thoughts 
in that moment because I think fear and trauma can be quite heavily linked but Mm -hmm. also they're quite different emotions how can we start to understand the difference between something that we're fearful of and that we live in fear or something that we're affected by trauma so fear is a response to something Mm -hmm. so a trauma is an event Mm -hmm. and a fear is your response to that event Mm -hmm. so we can be triggered then an early trauma or can be triggered in lots and lots of different situations if we have a trauma for example that's associated with being in a hospital then anytime we go into a hospital we might have that fear response and maybe there isn't a threat to us in that moment but we have a memory mm-hmm. of being in that traumatic experience that our body holds on to and then we react in that way because our brains are very clever they're able to identify threat and I think what happens when that goes into a kind of overdrive state is that we become very hyper vigilant and so we can get triggered in many many scenarios where we don't need to feel afraid but our trauma responses are being activated all the time which is often what happens with people when they're in a heightened state of anxiety they're being triggered a lot and it's about at that moment trying to reference where that's coming from in that moment I think the more that you can identify that you're having a response to something rather than thinking you need to react to something in that moment is quite key sometimes just being able to identify you're having a traumatic response and that if you wait it's going to pass if you ground yourself do things to make yourself feel safe then it will pass but quite often what we do before we have that insight is we try and change things so I'm feeling anxious so I'm going to leave this social event or I'm feeling anxious so I can't go out today or whatever it is your Mm -hmm. response is we're trying to manage the anxiety rather than self-soothe and that comes back to that inner child, doesn't it, of, mm-hmm. of that self-soothing that, that you just referenced. And you touched upon something there about how we react and triggers from external things that are happening around us. How can we, in that moment, differentiate, well, this external problem is actually not as terrifying as I am interpreting it to be, as I'm internalising it in, in my brain, within my body. What is that? How can we differentiate in that reaction? How can we start seeing that these external triggers aren't the threats that we are internalising. I think sometimes that there could be a legitimate reason to be anxious. So I don't mm. think it's about telling yourself you shouldn't be feeling like that because I think that, again, devalidates you. So I think it's it's about accepting you feel a certain way and going into straight into a soothing place. So if, if one of my kids comes home and they're frightened about something, I won't sit there and tell them the reasons they shouldn't be frightened. I'll immediately respond with kind of soothing cues and it's okay and I'm here and I'm in comfort Mm. and we're no different no matter how old we get that's what we need we don't Mm. need to be told there's nothing to be scared of Mm. if we're scared Mm. the the fear is real anyway and that's bringing it back to connection Mm -hmm. and so how can these responses these fearful responses I mean anxiety is is quoted quite a lot today shameful disassociation how can these impact our relationships if this is the kind of core solution How can these negative triggers and responses that that we experience impact our relationships? Because we define ourselves so often by these symptoms of trauma that we're having, Mm. anxiety or depression, and we define ourselves by them and then we feel very ashamed of them. Or we take responsibility for some of the past events and experiences we've had and we define ourselves by them. So rather than feeling, for example, the difference between guilt, feeling guilty about something, we would say, right, I feel guilty about that and I feel guilty about that because I don't think I behaved in the right way and we have an opportunity to make amends, to atone for whatever it is that we feel like we did wrong. Shame doesn't do that. Mm. Shame is not um, I've done something bad, shame is I am bad and it shuts us down and it means that we isolate and we hide and we don't allow people to see who we really are because we're terrified of being seen. The kind of contrast to that is that we're desperate to be seen because we're so lonely Mm. and we're so isolated, even in relationship, because if we don't allow people to access who we really are, kind of the good, bad, the ugly, like Mm. uh, just as we all are, just made up of different pieces, we feel like we have to be hidden. And when we have to hide, we engage in relationships and we try and control how we're being perceived and we try and control other people and as soon as we do that there is no space for intimacy you can have intimacy or you can have control in a relationship you can't have both and when we try and control people people withdraw is this on a similar line to where people might be repeating the same patterns here so say if they're in a detrimental relationship and then there seems to be a a, a continuous synergy of the same relationship it sounds like from listening to you that seems to be quite a cool reason and yeah that be centered around shame 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we would we would seek out unconsciously people and experiences that are going to fulfill the story that we have about ourselves. So I'll always ask a client, what's the story you're telling yourself about who you are and your place in the world? Because everything you are doing, consciously or unconsciously, is seeking out evidence to support that story. We all do it. Mm. Our lives are, rightly or wrongly, a manifestation of what we believe about ourselves to be true. Mm. If we believe we can succeed, we succeed. If we believe we're, we're going to fail, we fail. I guess it's like when people feel that shame, they're going, okay, I feel it, but like, how do I then... What do I do? Like, it's that moment when you're like, okay, I get people it. People don't think, I, no, what do I do, though, do they? People just go, oh. I hate myself. I'm okay. a piece of crap. That's what people do. That is shame, yeah. Because it's I am, not I did. Mm. And even if we recognise we've behaved badly in moments, which we all do, it isn't I behaved really badly, I need to resolve that or I need to work on that. It's I hate behaved really badly because I am bad. Got you. Because I am a bad person. And there is something Why's wrong that? with me. The story is that I am defective in some way. And that is true for everybody mm. with this kind of burden mm. of negative mental health that they feel they're not just feeling depressed they're not just feeling anxious they are feeling self-loathing they are feeling like there is something wrong with them and that they are the exception to the rule right and that if people see them for who they really are that they will oh, reject like them that. yeah so that moment when you feel shame how do you then <clears throat> Well, one, are people identifying that that's the shame that they're feeling? Maybe not. Um, but if they are identifying how they feel, how can they then rectify that feeling and turn it into something that's more powerful and a productive emotion? Because we need to learn that our internal response is the problem rather than the external event. Mm. So we're going to go through difficult things. Our response to it is key. If when something challenging or difficult happens, whether it's in work or personal life, whatever it is, if we then attribute that to some personal failing, some defect in our character, there is no room for self-development or growth in that space. Mm. If we can recognise that we've been faced with a challenging life event, if we can reflect on that, think about what we can gain from that, what wisdom there is in that experience to take from, then there's room for growth. Mm. Anything difficult now, and I particularly recognise this with some of like early traumas that I've had, I recognise the wisdom that's been gained in those experiences. I recognise the privilege that I have to be able to empathise with people as a result of some of those traumas that I've been through. And although I'd never want to relive them, mm. um, I'm still grateful for them because it's given me a gift of something that I otherwise wouldn't have. Mm. And... It's, it's being able to reframe how you're seeing things, mm. I think. And for people who might be feeling this and trying to think about the reframing, there's a, and you, I'm bringing it back again to bravery, which you mentioned earlier. It's that step into taking, you know, harnessing those emotions and not being scared of them and not being ashamed of them. Like, that's the moment that I'm trying to figure out how we can get people to get to that next stage once, mm -hmm. they're, once they're in that moment. Do you know what? A client asked me the other day, she was saying that she's done amazingly well in her recovery and she said, but she's now challenging herself in a new way and she's really scared professionally and she keeps on getting triggered and anxious and she's frightened. How can I stop feeling like that? I'm like, you're never going to stop feeling like that. Every time we kind of challenge ourselves or up level we face a new kind of terrain of uncertainty and in that we feel anxious or apprehensive. And rather than those anxious feelings being a kind of our reason to withdraw and to hide, we remind ourselves of our resilience, we remind ourselves of our ability to survive these difficult things and challenge ourselves to put one foot in front of the other regardless. Mm. So being brave isn't about not being scared. It's about doing it anyway. That sounds like a bit of a cliche, but the cliches are always cliches because they're true, right? Mm. So I think it's more about reframing what we see ourselves as capable of mm -hmm. and trusting that actually fear and apprehension is part of what it is to be human. I guess it's about also breaking that glass ceiling of perfection. Mm -hmm. And there's a shield that so many of us try to show to the world of, you know, this is who we are. You know, I'm Emmy. I've got a fantastic, mm -hmm. successful clinic in London for the last 
15 years. Mm-hmm. These are my experiences. This is the book I've done. I'm a, you know, a, a, a best-selling author. And all of these things from the outside, it looks perfect and the perfection. And yet to kind of strip away any parts that might not be mm-hmm. shows this huge vulnerability. And it can be quite tiring to keep up with that outward-facing persona that we all have within us. Where do you find comfort in those moments? I think um, it's what I was referring to before about when we're striving for that perfection, what we're really doing is trying to control how we're being perceived. Mm. So all of those things could be seen as our brand, that we start to think about ourselves as some sort of product that has to look or behave in a certain way. I will always talk about my failures or my vulnerabilities with my clients because it's really important to challenge those ideals that we have and to recognize that they're not real for a start and that there is no such thing as perfect and even when we think we're aspiring to that what does that even really mean do we really want to be seen as somebody who never makes mistakes or never gets things wrong or do we want to seem like we're brave in the face of adversity and that actually we can be trusted to hold those kind of darker parts of ourselves when we talk about shadow work and hiding Actually shining the light on ourselves is so much harder, I think, because those parts of yourself you're ashamed of that you want to hide from people, when you're willing to step into the light and be a beacon and hold yourself up and go, actually, I'm not perfect, and actually the blood, sweat and tears that went into building a clinic or writing a book, whatever it is, or having a marriage, they're really difficult things that I've had to challenge myself to to do, to be intimate and to be vulnerable. It's been really hard. And part of that journey I'm willing to share with people in the hope that they'll benefit from it too. And I think there's humility in that space. Humiliation is about shame. It's about people seeing you and mocking you, Mm. the truth of who you are. But I feel like a lot of people, and there definitely is definitely something that I will admit to for sure. Mm. I think there's a huge mm. thing of, you know, when you're especially forward facing as, as, a, as a person, you mm. put a lot of your life out there mm-hmm. and your learnings. Of course, people are going to always judge you that it's just part of you are not going to please everybody. But it doesn't mean that you're not human. And those, mm-hmm. those words and those comments and that judgment isn't going to affect you. And that's where the humiliation for me really, really mm-hmm. lies quite deep. But that becomes part of parcel of, of obviously being, you know, outward facing and, mm-hmm. and, and sharing. But I think, you know, also putting that authenticity across of who you are more often to more people does shed more vulnerability for you. So your fear does increase. And I think that's it with anyone, even if they're not putting that self out publicly even towards their friends Mm -hmm. they're still open to more judgment Mm -hmm. even doing it to one person in a relationship you're then open to somebody maybe humiliating you behind your back I mean it's such it's kind of all different facets of life and we still I still believe that many of us see vulnerability as a weakness as opposed to a strength yeah I think it is true and I think you're right that culturally we still live in a place where it's it's not the norm to be vulnerable and sharing or talking about our mental health at all it is seen as a weakness but I think it's a very antiquated view and I think what I learn from my kids particularly all the time is how much more comfortable they are with having a language around how they feel that I didn't growing up and that's amazing to me and I'm welcoming of that So I think it's hopefully something that's changing. Through many of us, I think the younger generation are much more aware of their emotions and how they're feeling. But I also think we're in a culture where we are so ingrained in comparison, perfection, constant attention from digital assets such as social media or emails or, you know, there's so many things that we're competing with more than probably we competed as when Mm -hmm. we grew up. And I think that can also be quite hard then to define your emotions and place them when you're bombarded constantly from from different areas. So within your book, you really talk about how we can harness through 11 different steps of practice our own mental health. So obviously you've touched upon many things such as trauma, vulnerability, shame, lots of different emotions that you know, we can disassociate from. One of those steps, one of those 11 steps you talk about is is life scripts. Can you explain a little bit more to the listener about what that is? Mm -hmm. So the book's called Find Your True Voice. So it's about trying to connect with your authentic self. Mm. And part of that journey and really fundamental to that is uncovering what your life script is. So what's the story you're telling yourself about who you are and your place in the world? And also what's formed that story? Where's it come from? 
So some of the messages that we've received growing up will be from the people that raised us culturally, as you've identified. And there'll be lots of different things that have happened, experiences that we've had that have given us a picture and an idea of who we are and our place in the world. And that story is dictating everything that we do. So if there are parts of our lives where we're not thriving, if we can identify negative patterns, even in behavior or in relationships that are playing out, we're the common denominator. We're the people that are going into those scenarios again and again, that those same things are happening. And quite often we'll tell ourselves a story around that, that we're unlucky or that we're always the victim in a scenario or that we're always being cheated on in relationships or whatever it is. And actually, we're the common thread. And so being able to identify those patterns is really, really key to think about, actually, what is the story? And if the story isn't working for us, then we have an opportunity to rewrite it. Because so much of these ideas that we have about ourselves, they're not ours. They've been inherited. I'll always give the example that so many of us don't really think about who we vote for. What are our kind of political alignments? They're not ours often. They've come because our parents voted for people or maybe we've rebelled against that maybe we've informed ourselves and now we've got different opinions but so often we don't we've just gone that way and we don't question it and that's true for loads of different things in our lives that it doesn't even occur to us to challenge or think about but a lot of them aren't working for us Mm -hmm. because unless we're fortunate to be raised by people who had extremely good insight and empowered us to become kind of champions of our own potential Mm -hmm. which many of us didn't Mm -hmm. then we end up a bit stuck and we get stuck in other people's stories as well. So highlighting that gives you an opportunity to change things. And is that something you see as a constant thread through your clinic of people telling themselves their own narrative? And I think a lot of the time we tell ourselves what we really want to hear. Yeah, it becomes self-fulfilling because we're invested in the story. Mm. You know, we're drawn to what's familiar, even when what's familiar isn't very good to us Mm. or good for us. You know, we will be drawn to those things. We're all comfortable with what we know, aren't we? Even if what we know isn't great. And that's why pushing ourselves to do something different or or challenging ourselves can be so hard. But it doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Mm. But because we feel anxious, because we feel fearful, Mm. we withdraw and we stay where safe. That's true for a lot of people. A lot of us don't fulfil our potential because we're a bit scared to. And it's, that's where the bravery comes in. Mm-hmm. And so how do you, I guess, contextualise when somebody has found their own true voice? I think these moments happen in ways that you can only identify yourself because they're so personal. When I met my husband, I knew he must be a good guy because I knew I was treating myself with kindness and I couldn't possibly attract something other than that. And that was a moment of clarity for me to go, something's changed because otherwise I wouldn't feel like this. Somebody messaged me literally a couple of days ago to say that they were crying about something and then they heard a voice saying in their own head, you're a good person. And it was the first time they'd ever heard it. And so in that moment, she knew something healing had happened to her that she'd never been able to identify before. So these moments that that we go through... They're not about a checklist. Recovery isn't about that or healing isn't about that. It's about something spiritual that happens within you, like something loving and knowing that happens that means that you can shift things. And I think that that's different for everybody. I think that, to me, sounds like contentment. Yeah, I think it is a contentment. And I think it's about knowing that actually what we're seeking doesn't exist outside of ourselves and I think that is the key thing Mm -hmm. you know in all the books that we can read we can look for answers and we can look for guidance but Rumi said what's seeking you it already exists within you and it's so true Mm -hmm. you know that actually that knowing that we're trying to connect with is that voice that we already have that we don't trust you know we've all had it that voice that goes don't do that that's not a good idea and you're like nah I'm doing it anyway Mm -hmm. or that date you go on that's like don't do that it's not going to end well and you think no I'm doing it Mm. it's there anyway it's trying to guide us and so much of the work is about trusting ourselves to listen and that voice might be a whisper maybe you've ignored it for a long time but paying attention to it you can start to strengthen it And then it becomes masterful Mm. and you don't have to control everything. We don't worry about the humiliation because we have no control. We just surrender and we trust and that's all we can do. So that finding of your true self, while I think many of us 
maybe seeking to find their true selves or, or seeking what that really means or maybe questioning through listening to everything we're covering at the moment maybe they're analyzing it and that can come through journaling I always found quite helpful mm-hmm. actually especially in my early 20s where I found it quite hard to pinpoint how I felt mm-hmm. um, or actually who I was because being a model you're actually just morphed into different characters mm-hmm. um, into different situations every day so you actually become quite good at this outward shell as opposed to actually going like who who am I <laughs> what do I enjoy what do I not enjoy and I found that really really helpful but something I think that is really interesting through this journey of self which I read about probably in the last few years, is is trauma bonds. And I know I'm referencing back to where we started, but can you give a bit of an analogy of what a trauma bond is and how we maybe notice if we are currently in one or if that's what we're seeking? Yeah, a trauma bond is essentially where we're drawn to somebody and the the essence of the relationship is based on shared traumatic experiences or separate but familiar traumatic experiences. But it's... effectively dysfunctional Mm -hmm. so so much of the time when we're we haven't processed trauma and we're not able to be intimate in relationships we'll take on different controlling roles in relationships where we maybe fall into a rescuer role with our partner and they're in victim or that might shift and it might reverse we go into victim and they take on the role of rescuing us but it's a way we're not able to set boundaries or meet our needs in a healthy way because our needs become about another person rather than separate where Mm. you're able to exist in a healthy space where you support one another but always maintaining and having a sense of what your needs are in a relationship Mm. they become merged Mm. and I think that is definitely a definition of of of, again finding who you really are and what's really important to you and, and setting boundaries within yourself I think we think about setting boundaries with work but we don't necessarily think about setting boundaries with with ourselves and Mm -hmm. I think that's really important to just help emphasize what's important for us and Mm -hmm. and that's validated and so another question is the fear of reaching our true potential self and where we might see that we'd like to go or where we wish we'd like to go we all think we all kind of have this future forward thinking of in 10 years I'd like to be x Mm. why can we get so scared of, of reaching our full potential reaching your full potential means being seen and I think if you haven't worked through things and you're scared of being seen the more you kind of shine a light on yourself there's nowhere to hide is there and I think that's what it's all about Mm. I'm reminded of randomly I don't know if you'll keep this in actually but I'm reminded of this part of an Elvis song um, that he could never sing live various different bits of research done on this and why he couldn't but it was uh, a section in a song that talked about being on a stage and there being emptiness all around and he literally couldn't sing it and I think it was about that vulnerability of what happens if you're on a stage and there's emptiness all around and it's just you and where do you go in that moment there's nowhere to hide and it's that's I think what we're so fearful of I think there's something else as well around making it and realizing that wasn't what you needed to fill that void and the void still being there. And I think that's true for so many of us that have this kind of strivers curse mm. where the goalposts are always shifting because you never get to where you need to go because you're looking in the wrong place. And you feel that that end goal is a happiness? I think it's a contentment more than a happiness. I think we can be sad and content, happy and content. We can be sad and happy. I think mm. it's not defined by an emotion necessarily. I think it's just letting go I think that's probably one of the biggest things to contentment isn't it is mm-hmm. it's pure letting go and taking yeah. and taking that weight off being in that kind of gasp when you're just like do you know what it doesn't matter anymore and I think so many of us probably strive for that but whether we get that is a different is a different answer what's the one piece of wisdom that you would like to share that you've learned over your life I think that there's wisdom in the experience I think being looking at everything that you go through with a curiosity of what can I learn from this what how can I harness this experience and grow from it it means that nothing is irrelevant and everything matters and everything is important and that you are important and what you do matters and that as a human being you are worthy of love kindness and respect and that isn't conditional on anything it's not conditional on what you maybe did or didn't do or experiences you maybe had or didn't have it's based just on that you're a human being and if you can kind of absorb that and be anchored by that and that influence and be the blueprint for how you treat other people then there's only good places to go with that and my final question 
is what does live well, be well mean to you? I think it comes back to that something about surrender and that just let it go, let it go, man. Just like love and peace, surrender. <laughs> stop trying so hard yeah. stop trying to control everything and that's my like daily battle or battle maybe too strong a word daily thing that I work towards is just surrender always and trust that I'm being guided by something greater than myself that's got a better idea than I do about how things should play out and you know what the letting go thing is so important because I think when we don't we hold it in our bodies and that's when we can become quite sick where we can get stomach pains, where we can get high blood pressure, when chronic diseases might start, if there's long-term chronic stress. And it's about that kind of holding it in and, 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 and feeling inside that you can't let it go as well. I think that's such a yeah. big thing. But it's an illusion to think you're controlling anything anyway. Like surrender gives way to infinite possibility. What a great way to end the podcast surrender mm -hmm. so if people want to surrender mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit more and, and obviously you have so many different areas that they can become involved in what you do from your book mm -hmm. to your clinic to your website to your e well to, to your instagram to everything um your youtube channel as well that has some really good videos on there would you be able to direct our listeners on to how they can know more about you yep um if you're looking for more kind of therapeutic guidance then the recoverclinic.co.uk is a really good resource and then if you're looking for more sort of self-development empowerment then go on to emmybronner.com and you'll find everything there that you need and your book the book is called find your true voice and it's available uh, at waterstones or blackwells if you're international and amazon obviously Amazing. thank you so much Emmy. you're so welcome <laughs> Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Live Well, Be Well. All the information covered in today's podcast with important links is in today's show notes. And if you haven't yet, please do hit the subscribe button and do share this with friends, family, co-workers, whoever you love, please share this podcast. It means more than you realize. And until next week, I hope you all live well and be well. If you love this podcast, I would really urge you to support us on Patreon. Our Patreon community really do help keep this podcast going. And alongside being within the community, you can also get exclusive access to early release podcasts and specific Q&As with me on topics that you want to hear. Being a Patreon member of this podcast does really help keep the support going because it's not easy to deliver this every week without you guys. So thank you so much. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please go to patreon forward slash livewellbewell to become a member and support this podcast.